Hi everybody, my name is Brendan Baylod, and I'm a book collector and part-time appraiser based in Madison, Wisconsin. I uh, have been asked to do a short talk about book valuation and appraisal for the real world. Um, so many uh, times we've seen these book appraisers on TV shows or like Pawn Stars or uh, you know, uh, Antiques Roadshow, where they're talking about books that are worth ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and they're describing them using sort of stilted language, and you know, um, as if we were all, uh, you know, Victorian, uh, you know, gentlemen and ladies in our smoking jackets and gowns, you know, and and that's not the real world, right? Those of us who collect nowadays, we're collecting books that are worth fifty, a hundred, two hundred, maybe a thousand dollars, right? And you know, we want to know. Uh, what our books are worth and, uh, you know, why they're worth what they're worth and how to collect. So the real purpose of this talk is to kind of to describe uh, book valuation and appraisal for the real world, for people who really collect books. Um, and also because, you know, so many times I see that people are asking these questions on social media sites. You know, what's my book worth? And they're getting 20 answers and, you know, they all disagree with each other. And by the time they're done, they're, you know, they're more confused than when they came in. And 90% of the time, I think those people could have answered those questions on their own. Um, and so I hope to give you a little bit of guidance in how to do your own research as well. Um, so without further ado, let's dive in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, myself and, and my background. Then I'm going to dive into the whole question of what's my book worth and how to do your own research. I'll talk a little bit about uh, book collecting and valuation. Who is collecting and why? I'll talk about types of value, which is real important, and then drivers of value. What makes specific books valuable and others not? And then I'll talk a little bit about appraisals before I wrap up. All right. Um, so I talked a little bit about my background as a collector and appraiser. I have about 5,000 books. My general background is Great Lakes uh, Regional and Maritime History. Um, although I have been doing appraisals for about 20 years, and uh, I have uh, mostly done it for museums, uh, where they have people, who, donors, who, who want to know what, what their donation is worth for tax purposes. Um, and so I don't really do paid work outside of my area of expertise, which I think is important. Um, but I got into it just like, uh, you know, most of you in terms of what, wanting to find out what books should cost and said I was a collector, and I wanted to know what I should pay. And, uh, and I also wanted to know what, what my books were really worth. <clears throat> so 90% of the people who want to know what their book's worth and really need to ask that question can really find out on their own. There are a couple of good ways to do that. And I'll tell you a little bit about, and for, for some of you, this is all going to be old news, but for a lot of people, it won't be. So ABE Books is really the biggest online listing service for books right now in the world. Uh, the vast majority of booksellers nowadays sell their books online. And when they do, they list them on ABE Books. ABE is owned by Amazon, and it's primarily dedicated to collectible books. Not necessarily high-end collectible books, but just collectible books. Now, there are other meta searches like Via Libri and uh, BookFinder.com, but those are meta searches that are largely searching the ABE Books database. Now, there are a couple other online books listing services as well, uh, the International League of Antiquarian Booksellers and also the Antiquarian Bookseller Association of America, ABAA. They also have their own databases and listings, but most sellers who list on ILAB and ABAA are also listing on ABE books. So when you go to ABE, you're really getting a pretty good population size when you search for a title. So... What's the difference between something like ABE and maybe something like eBay? eBay is a different marketplace. eBay is for people who want to monetize their books within a week or a month, right? Market value. eBay is for people that want to sell their book now. ABE is for boutique sellers who can afford to sit on their books for a year, two, or three to wait for the right buyer to come along. And so the prices you're going to see, the asking prices in particular, on these uh, book listing engines are going to be higher um, than people who want to turn their book into money in a week, right? Now, one of the things about, about ABE that's nice, though, is you can see a lot of different copies. You can see, uh, you know, poor condition copies or, you know, different editions um, that are perhaps less. You know, if you go to ABE, you're seeing 
asking prices though, not selling prices. That's a really important concept that I'm going to hammer on throughout this talk. Um, however, it's useful because if they have 20 copies for sale and the cheapest one's $20 and the most expensive one's 100 guess what? Your book's probably worth between $20 and $100, right? So you can tell a lot by looking at these sites. But what you can't necessarily tell is, you know, exactly what your book is worth. Or if your book's not on there, or if there's only one or two copies, you have to be really careful. It really behooves you to look at eBay and, and go down to their, uh, their search um, uh, choices and select to see books that have sold. Look at sold prices. They only list the last three months of sold prices, but they're often very instructive because that's going to be the price that you could get for the book, unless, of course, you happen to be a book, uh, an online bookseller. <laughs> that said, you can also look at a site like WorthPoint. So what WorthPoint does is they save uh, eBay auction results going back about 15, 20 years. Uh, it's a paid subscription site. You can look at all of the listings that they have, but they won't show you the, the prices unless you subscribe. And it's, I think it's about $20 a month. I have subscribed before when I was, you know, asked to do an appraisal. Um, but a very useful site as well to see what things have actually sold for on the market. So I would encourage everybody, do your own research uh, first before going on to a social media site and trying to crowdsource your valuation because when you crowdsource oftentimes there's just so much white noise that it's very hard to tell to, to really get usable information or valuable information from crowdsourcing try your own research but what if you're not in that 90% of, of people who who can find you know a quick answer um, that's what the rest of this talk is about so say you've got that book that you know there's no other copies of you know how can you tell if it's valuable well, let's talk about what determines value. And this is going to be helpful for people who want to maybe understand what drives the collecting market. This isn't uh, about what drives, you know, say Amazon books or new books that people just go out and buy. I'm talking about books that people are buying because they want a special copy of it. They want a signed edition. They want an old edition. They want to buy it as a piece of antiquarian history in and of itself, right? Value is determined by who is collecting and why they're collecting it. So let's talk about the why. The main collectible genres that I see, that I get asked about the most, are, are community history, exploration history, cultural history, a lot of history. That seems to be a hot spot. A second to that is science, books about natural history, uh, you know, and sciences, not textbooks, not things like that books from the early 1900s and from the 1800s and 1700s. Next is, is literature. Classics, children's literature and fantasy is also very collectible, particularly uh, for nostalgia reasons, but also, uh, you know, from the 17 and 1800s. Probably after that would be modern first editions. Uh, 20th century authors of note, uh, people who, who really love their works, their works were very meaningful to them intellectually, and so they want a first edition and sometimes they want it signed. Another area you might not think of is Bibles and religious texts. Uh, there's quite a market for those, particularly the big ornate Bibles. I don't have much, much experience in appraising those, but I do get asked about them quite a lot, and people do post about them, so I do know that's a hot area. I'm sorry if I missed you know your your area there there are a lot of areas i've glossed over here these are this is supposed to be sort of a high level broad overview but there are many little niche areas that are highly collectible um uh, and i wished i had time to go into all of them because some are fascinating but um one of the things to keep in mind is that collectors are not often interested in reading the book they've probably already read it which is why they want a special copy the book to them is a piece of art and a piece of history. A lot of people are interested in fine bindings. I don't mean the fine bindings that came out of the arts and crafts movement of the you know, late 1800s in England. Those are really, really high end. I'm talking about good leather bindings that have shelf presence and patina. Those are two terms I'm going to use here. Again, um, a book that has shelf presence you notice it. It looks good on the shelf. It draws the eye and it says, I'm an old and special book. And patina, 
refers to the fact that the book looks well used and well loved and it looks like the piece of history that it is and here you see a set of legal uh, maritime uh, case law briefs here on my shelf these have patina uh, you can't argue with it <laughs> they are a beautiful binding they are leather bound with with raised bands with gilt with uh, color and they have patina they show that they've been well loved now mind you they don't look damaged they don't look destroyed they don't look like they're distressed but they have patina so another thing to keep in mind is that people who are buying collectible books are buying them as an expression of their personal identity these are people who are intellectually curious they've read a book and it, and it, and it impacted their lives and it became part of their identity who they are and they want special copies of these books um, or in other instances, you know, maybe they're a researcher and maybe it's an important part of, you know, the, the study that they've decided to devote their lives to. And so they want old and original copies. Um, and so the books are not so much something that they buy because they're going to read and then get rid of it. They are building a collection because they are building a fund of knowledge uh, that matches their intellectual curiosity. So these are important things to understand about who is collecting and why they're collecting. And that has some implications that I'm going to go into a little further. Um, a few more cultural considerations that you should know about if you're a collector. Um, serious book collectors used to come from the top 10% of the socioeconomic strata. So you'd get, you know, sort of the picture of the, you know, the Bostonian in his, you know, smoking jacket with his ascot on and talking in stilted language about, you know, fine literature. That era is long gone. But unfortunately, when you see a lot of appraisers, of book appraisers on TV, they're still living in that, or at least they're trying to portray that. Uh, most of us nowadays are uh, still people that, that have uh, disposable income uh, because nobody buys a $200 book on a regular basis unless they've got some discretionary income. However, most collectors nowadays come from you know the sort of the professional technical class. Uh, there aren't a lot. Of, there's not a lot of old money type book collectors out there. I mean, there are some. You know, obviously, there's some people buying those $10,000 and $20,000 books, but mostly they're buying them to donate to museums. You know, that's not what most of us are buying, and that's not what I'm seeing as an appraiser. One, one cautionary note is that there are way fewer young people collecting, and this is an ongoing trend, and it's caused largely by the de-emphasis of, of um, education uh, in the areas of, of culture and arts. Our educational system is becoming very vocationalized as young people are far more concerned about, you know, going to school to get a job as opposed to going to school to learn how to learn or to build a fund of knowledge or to satisfy their own intellectual curiosity. In fact, I, I would say that, you know, in, in many ways, our modern educational system discourages intellectual curiosity in favor of, of, of a vocational practicality. And that is having an impact on the book collecting market. And it will continue to. So something to keep in mind. But those of us who collect are generally, and this is, again, I'm gonna, I can't reiterate this enough, are not specifically interested in the information in the copy of the book we're buying. We've probably already read it or it's available online in a modern reprint. We're buying it because of what the book represents to us. And because of that, things like shelf presence, the addition of the book, the condition, the patina are all very important much more important than in say you know somebody who's out on amazon looking for the latest books that they want that they want to read for entertainment uh, lastly i want to mention one other cultural important cultural concept for collectors and that's that we are custodians um, uh, here you see uh, one of john disternell's uh, inland seas immigrant travelers guides from 1863 from my personal collection um, i'm not the first owner of this book i'm probably not the 10th owner of this book and I'm not going to be the last owner of this book. Uh, this is a piece of history. I didn't buy this book to read it. I already know what it contains. I bought this book because it is in and of itself an important historical artifact. Um, and I, my collection is insured. My collection is earmarked to be donated. If something were to happen to me, it goes to a museum. I've made uh, arrangements to properly conserve my collection. Uh, I don't have it in direct sunlight. I don't have it in uh, high moisture conditions. I've made um, a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of arrangements so that I know my books will be in good condition. 
So keep that in mind as a collector. A lot of people collect books and they don't think about what's going to happen to their books. So uh, you owe it to your books and you owe it to the next generation. All right, let's dive into some of the uh, things about value. There are really three different types of value that books have, uh, really that anything has. But in particular genres of books, this is generally consistent across all, all genres of books. They have a liquidation value, a market value, and an insurance or replacement value. And people have different synonyms for these, but they generally are consistent. Liquidation value, I've been asked to, to assess that before. Um, people oftentimes have to liquidate their collection either due to bankruptcy, um, divorce, um, or... Um, a death if you don't have an, a, a will and your collection goes through probate um, an auctioneer will be hired they will come to your your house they will put price tags on the books a hundred people will show up in the yard and they will bid and uh, you know uh, they want to liquidate it right now they need to turn your estate into money that happens uh, to books more often than you would think that's how antique shops uh, get filled so um, that is a value that uh, is pretty low uh, generally well below market value. Market value is what you pay on eBay or from private seller. Uh, market value is really important. This is when you look and see what do things actually sell for when people are trying to monetize them fairly quickly. Obviously not you know same day at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an auction sale, but say on eBay. And um, that's the price that I use when I assess things for um, donation. Uh, for a tax deduction. Now, uh, there's another value, and that's insurance or replacement value, and that can be much higher. And here's why. Uh, say uh, somebody steals one of my books, or I lose it in a fire. My insurance company is going to replace that book, uh, but I'm not going to have a year or two to, you know, bargain shop like I normally do, right? I'm going to go out, and I'm going to have to buy that book tomorrow. And when I do that, you know, I, I probably am not going to go on eBay. There might not be a copy on eBay. I'm going to go to ABE Books. I'm going to buy it from a boutique seller. And I'm going to pay, you know, replacement cost. That's going to be high, right? But that is what you have to consider when you do an, a, a, an appraisal for replacement value. It is what it's going to, what it, what, it, what it sells for uh, uh, on ABE, for example. So these are three different values. Uh, and it's important to understand what we're talking about you know, when we're talking about these different types of value. There are also uh, big differences, as I said, between asking and selling prices, and I can't hammer on that enough. Uh, we're talking here about selling prices, not about asking prices. Um, it can be difficult to understand what selling prices are for insurance or replacement value because those aren't always advertised. But if you watch the market long enough, you get to understand pretty well what uh, things sell for if you have two or three years to wait for the right buyer. So let's dive into uh, what really determines then um, value of books and what they really sell for. There are tangible drivers of price and intangible drivers of price. The tangible drivers of price, by tangible I mean aspects of the books themselves. And so the number one tangible are the attributes of the book. The edition, the binding, the signature, and the provenance. Um, so obviously people like first editions of books that is generally true in the 20th century however in 18th and 17th century books and 19th century books uh, sometimes the second or third edition was better because it had better illustrations or plates or maps or typesetting or it was revised and so keep that in mind that the first is not necessarily the most desirable uh, in earlier books um, also, a lot of people aren't aware that bindings uh, really have a big impact, particularly in collectible books from, say, the 19th century. Uh, earlier books weren't always sold bound. They oftentimes were sold unbound, and then, you know, um, Victorian gentlemen and ladies would send them to their personal binder and have them bound in, in a binding of their choice. A lot of publishers in those days would offer books in multiple bindings. You could buy them in cloth. You could buy them, buy them in pebble. You could buy them in, uh, in uh, half leather, uh, three-quarter leather, or full leather. And uh, fine leather, Morocco. Um, and so collectors often want the better bindings, provided they're in good condition. Um, 
signatures in books are very important by the author. Um, if a book is signed, it, it, it can really enhance the value of a book, uh, particularly if there isn't a lengthy, um, you know, postscript to, to a person after the signature that can sometimes reduce the value a little bit, unless, of course, the person that it's written out to is also noteworthy, in which case the book has provenance. Uh, I have a number of books that have the book plate of a fairly famous person, or in some instances, in natural history books, the book plate of a prominent science library can also enhance the value of a book. So not all ex-lib copies are necessarily bad if it's from the library of a famous person or a, or a prominent science library. All right. The next big condition or determinant, probably more so even than the attributes in some, t some instances, is condition. Uh, when we're talking about books from the 17 and 1800s, the completeness of the book can be very important. Um, of many books, uh, the, 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 the maps, plates, and, and pages of the book are oftentimes missing because some of these books were broken up and the contents were sold off separately. That's particularly true of, of, of early books with maps. I own a 1698 copy of uh, Father Lewis Hennepin's New Discovery of a Vast Country in America. Um, about the LaSalle expeditions down the Mississippi River. Um, the maps in those books are worth $2,000 a piece. The book itself might be worth about $800. Uh, obviously, if you get the book with the maps, that's really um, you know worth about you know, $5,000. But the book is, so, is very rarely found with the original maps and plates in it. So keep in mind that the maps and plates can make or break the value of some books. The book has to be complete. Um, the next damage to a book really impacts the value. Uh, red rod, in particular, on leather bindings. Um, most of the leather used to bind books between about 1850 and 1920 was tanned with the uh, vegetable tanning process that rendered it susceptible to uh, acidification red rod from being exposed to moisture. And you can see it on books. The book looks powdery, you know, kind of a mottled color. And if you wipe your hand down the leather, you'll get this red powder on your hand. That's the name red rot. Red rot can be uh, arrested with uh, substances like cellugel or clusal G, but once the damage is there, uh, the color damage or literal pieces of the leather broken off or flaking off or the covers will actually become dis detached, that has to be uh, fixed by a professional restorer. And I do some restoration myself on my own books, and I'm, I'm fairly good at it. I won't say I'm the best. Um, I've been doing it for about 20 years. Um, but and there's some stuff that I can't do that I'm just not skilled enough at. But it costs some money, so keep that in mind. Moisture damage can be particularly difficult to repair. Things like, uh, you know, cloth that's become uh, rippled from moisture, pages that have become uh, rippled, uh, boards that have become uh, warped or cupped, um, foxing, that's where the pages themselves have uh, this uh, sort of red speckling on it due to uh, acidification. And probably worst of all is crude repairs. When you see tape all over a book, particularly acidic um, masking tapes, scotch tapes, I've seen you know duct tape on rare books. Um, if a book has was was offered with a dust jacket, particularly this is common in 20th century books. If it's a collectible, it absolutely has to have its dust jacket. Uh, if a book was issued with a dust jacket and it doesn't have it, in very rare instances it'll still be collectible, but in most instances it won't be. Uh, if you do get a dust jacket, make sure you uh, put Mylar, uh, a broad art uh, covering over it, particularly if it's a rare book that you want to preserve that dust jacket on. And the last aspect of condition I'll talk about is uh, what I call library malfeasance. Uh, here uh, you see a picture of my uh, McKenney and Hall Indian Tribes of North America, which has been, um, dare I call it, repaired by a library. Um, this is an example of what they do. Libraries are not interested in preserving the value of books. They're interested in preserving the usability. And so in this case, they uh, simply um, slapped on a, a ham-handed repair. Now, I was able to actually, believe it or not, um, restore this by removing that. And um, it, it took a lot of cosmetic work, but it doesn't draw your eye anymore. Obviously, it doesn't look original, but it's much better than, than when I acquired it. 
but uh, not everybody you know can do that and it's very difficult so keep your eye out for for library malfeasance like that that can really impact the value of books uh, as i mentioned most ex library books are worth considerably less if a book has been rebound in the library binding its collectible value is really largely destroyed all right let's move on uh, i mentioned visual appeal shelf presence and patina is really key things to book uh, collectors um, obviously they want books that look special because they are paying a lot of money for them or more they're not obviously buying the book to read they're buying the book to to to, to have and so um, if you're buying a book over a hundred dollars you're going to want to see a picture of it if you're selling it you should expect to have to provide a picture of it you want to see the book the book before you buy it and likewise if you're trying to put a value to your book uh, you should be aware of how it compares to other other copies that are available of it um, next uh, the next driver of price that's tangible is really the importance of the book itself in its genre and you can only know that if you're kind of an expert in the book's genre you can read up on it do a bibliographical search yourself online and probably figure out if it's important or not historical cultural or scientific importance is really driven by whether the book was written by somebody of note or whether it was a groundbreaking title or if it was considered very meaningful at its time a lot of those books uh, are still very valuable uh, likewise not every book that's titled the history of you know something or other uh, is is particularly valuable because uh, oftentimes they just weren't that meaningful or that important and that can be a big determinant of value lastly I'll talk about two concepts that are often confabulated with value and that's rarity and age uh, not all rare books are valuable and not all valuable books are rare there are many highly valuable books that were printed in huge numbers but because they were so desirable they were all bought and and people hold on to them likewise um, there are many obscure books that are worth 10 20 bucks you know uh, that are very old too if you, you can verify that too by going onto ABE books do a search for books that are older than 1850 or even older than 1800 and list them in order of price ascending you're going to see that there's a lot of 10 and 20 dollar books from say 1810 that are just not worth anything you know even in decent shape because they are yeah you know, a lot of old early victorian poetry books and things like that uh, that are not particularly well done um and likewise a old books now now yes it's true that all really valuable books are both usually old and rare but the, the the converse is not true so there are many old books and many rare books and uh that's not necessarily a determinant of value it, it it generally is you know i mean there are very very few books printed before 1810 that aren't worth 50 dollars right so but keep it in mind you, you're not necessarily sitting on a gold mine just because you have a book from the 1700s all right let's talk about intangibles um, these are some of the more important factors probably the number one determinant of value is cachet right and by cachet I mean you know what happened to say J.R.R. Tolkien's works after the Lord of the Rings movies I mean, they'd always been fairly collectible uh, because of the beat movement um, you know really really like those books but after the movies obviously they they really came on and uh, they've held their value quite well and there are, are a number of examples of that there are many booksellers that make their living by chasing after cachet they, they monitor what's hot and they uh, go after those books and they try to buy them and sell them and this isn't just new books uh, there are a lot of old books that have become popular again because of movies or because of um, you know cultural or political events so something to keep in mind um, probably one of the biggest things though and and this is really I would say maybe the biggest intangible driver is whether or not your book has a community of interest so something like Civil War buffs right is a common thing that obviously there are Facebook groups there are membership organizations there are bibliographic works just about Civil War literature and uh, so as you might expect you know there's a big market for Civil War books it is decreasing one you might not know of um, an example of, of an obscure uh, community is uh, self-help uh, movement books particularly Alcoholics Anonymous their early book uh, they call it their big book um, 
from, I think it's the late 1930s, is exceedingly valuable. Uh, first printing, first editions with dust jackets, 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars isn't unheard of. Second editions, you know, thousands, hundreds of dollars. So, uh, you know, and there are other little communities like that, niche communities where you wouldn't think, but the, but their books are highly collectible. And so most most appraisers and bookstore owners know those things, right? But but uh, you know something that you want to find out about your book. It, does it have a special community of interest? All right. Digitization has also impacted the value of books. In the case of my collection, you see here my big run of the annual list of U.S. merchant vessels. I use them because I'm a maritime historian and I write about ships and shipwrecks. Um, these were mostly digitized about 20 years ago and uh, put through optical character recognition with mixed results. Uh, so you can't really search them online. I still end up using mine a lot, so I'm glad I have a, a full run of them from 1867 all the way up to 1994. Um, but it has decreased the value. My books drop by about 50% due to the digitization, and, and that happens with other books as well. But it, digitization can also increase value for some books because it gives people visibility to certain titles that they couldn't otherwise read, and then they might get interested in them. That has happened in a few for some early collectibles. All right, the next thing I'm going to talk about, if there's one thing you take away from this talk, I hope it's this. And that is that uh, sellers can influence the market. Beware of titles that have only a few copies being offered at a high price. Uh, there's a good case in point in my collecting community. Um, there's a book called uh, uh, Great Lakes Coast Pilot. There are a couple different versions of them. They were offered between about 1850 and 1890, and they contain you know, navigation instructions and information about shipwrecks and hazards. And so they're pretty popular among, among people in my genre. Uh, they're generally worth between about $50 and $100. However, about 15 years ago, an antiquarian seller got his hands on one, and he couldn't find any others online. And so he took a guess at it, and he put a $1,000 asking price for it. Well, the next year, another antiquarian seller came by one, and he looked and saw this guy was asking 1000 so he asked 900 Well, the year after that, a third guy got one, and his was in the best condition of all, so he asked 1500 And then eight other sellers followed suit. And now there's, you know, 10 copies of Great Lakes Coast Pilots out there between, you know, 800 and $1,500. Well, the truth of the matter is, I just bought one last week on, on eBay for $80, and I bought one last year for 100 And that's what they sell for. I know it, because I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, these sellers have confabulated these prices, and then they, you know, herd behavior, they, they influence the price. Now, um, nobody buys those books. Those books sit up there, and they never will sell. But uh, those sellers don't know that, and it wasn't done maliciously. Uh, that's just how the, the, the seller market works. They uh, follow each other. Beware of that. It happens all the time. If you only see a few copies, make sure you look at the secondary market. Look at eBay. Look at the fast seller market and make sure that the book really goes for what, what, what those people are saying, because those markets often really differ. All right, let's move on to two other concepts before we switch gears. Um, a couple of things that really affect the value of books are the ambient level of cultural literacy and education. I talked about that already. If you live in a, in a rural area away from a university or in the middle of the country and you're trying to sell a, an antiquarian science book at a local antique shop, you know, you're not going to do that well with it. You're going to need to sell that on a larger market. Um, because there just aren't a lot of people interested. You need to be in a city, in many instances, to sell more arcane works. You need more people. And also, the economy has a big in impact. I, I've been alive long enough to see that um, when the economy is doing poorly, uh, people stop buying books, and they're willing to. Sellers are willing to deal. Uh, I'm recording this right now during the coronavirus epidemic, and boy, I'll tell you, there are a lot of good good deals right now coming on the market. So keep those things in mind. All right, let's change gears. So what if you, you've done all this research, you've done bibliographic studies, you just you really can't tell. The book is just so esoteric and so arcane that you've, you've tried to crowdsource it and you've gotten 20 different opinions. You may want to talk to a book appraiser. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I would recommend with that. So book appraisers are not licensed generally in most states. 
the book appraisal falls under personal property appraisers. And personal property appraisers are usually auctioneers and auction houses. They're usually involved in liquidating estates. Uh, the only licensed appraisers are usually real estate appraisers. So if you're looking for a licensed appraiser, that's not a thing for book appraiser use. There, there are certified appraisers. That are, certifications are offered through you know a lot of um, professional appraisal um, bodies, but uh, most of those are for full-time appraisers, and so most of those personal property appraisers are going to be people that are doing auctions. There are, as far as I know, are no professional certification or licensure bodies specific to book appraisal. Most book appraisers come from the uh, antiquarian bookseller market or from the expert collector market. That's where I come from. And we are usually contacted by personal property appraisers uh, who, when they encounter a specific genre and they need to find who the expert is in that genre. And I am the expert on Great Lakes maritime history uh, books. Uh, I have been for many years, and it's because I've done this for a long time. I'm published. I can, you know, uh, demonstrate my credentials. Um, when I write an appraisal, one of the things I do right away in the appraisals, I document my expertise. I give references of, of other appraisals I've done. I give uh, you know references to the books I've written. Um, and when I uh, appraise a book, I give price references, written price references of selling price examples from the from the different markets. Sometimes I will give the high and the low. You know, I'll give what a private you know what a what a an ABE bookseller is asking versus what it, what I've seen it sell for on on eBay. I'll, I'll mention comparables, you know. If there are no other copies that I can find, maybe I can find copies of similar books in similar genres by similar authors, right? That's usually possible to do. But I always explain the tangible and intangible factors that influence my value, especially if the book's worth over 100 or $500. I'm going to talk about things like, you know, um, the collector's market for it. Is there a community behind it? Um, is the book meaningful or, or particularly important to its genre? Uh, does it have a fine binding? Is it a first edition? Is there provenance? All of these things are things I'm going to document because I need to be able to defend that appraisal to both my client and to the IRS. Um, if, if an appraisal is over $5,000, the IRS will frequently audit it. And they're real good at reading appraisals, and, and, and they can tell right away if somebody is fudging it or if it's, you know, been done by somebody who knows what they're talking about. And if you're fudging it, you know, they can come back on you. So uh, just something to keep in mind. So appraisers, you should expect something in writing. There should be comparables, and it should be selling prices. All right, let's wrap up. So uh, just a little bit of uh, closing thoughts. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me, uh, brendan at baylaw.com. I am a pretty good generalist. I can tell you a lot about, you know, general book prices because I've searched through thousands of boxes of books and I can really quickly recognize a valuable uh, book. But uh, my expertise is really in Great Lakes regional and maritime history, leather-bound county histories, natural and scientific history of my area. Uh, early exploration, archaeology, native peoples, and I also do a lot with uh, photographs, stereopticons, maps and charts, and early ephemera, uh, woodcut engravings, things like that, uh, having to do with the uh, Great Lakes region. So I hope that you found this, uh, this talk um, helpful and that it's uh, given you some thought, some things to think about uh, with respect to not only valuing your books, doing your own research, but also, um, you know, collecting and, 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 and how and why you collect. So uh, thank you again for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So long.